How should CISOs approach the NIST II directive? Um, in my opinion, um, chief security officers should look at the NIST II directive uh, as most things in life, as a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, a challenge, of course, because they must implement new security measures, uh, report requirements, and they need to carry out and provide training. So they have more things to do but also as an opportunity because uh, when I speak to CISOs uh, across, uh, across Europe, uh, uh, one of their main issues, uh, uh, sometimes the main issue, is to convince uh, their own management in investing in cybersecurity and in setting up a culture of cybersecurity. So in my opinion, uh, with an ISO directive uh, now, when a CISO walks into a, a boardroom and speaks to the board of director and uh, asks, for example, for budget for implementing uh, security measures and uh, implementing, uh, as I was saying, a, a culture of cybersecurity, um, it will, of course, uh, uh, describe uh, the, let's say, the downsides of uh, being exposed or being breached uh, but then if uh, also can convey the message that if the requirements of this directive are not complied with, the management of the company will be held personally liable. Uh, that, in my opinion, is a pretty strong argument that will help CISOs across the industry in uh, uh, convincing that having a good cybersecurity measure is important. These types of directives are coming from you know, a place of concern. Uh, and, and so, you know, organizations really do need to recognize that this is not, um, not something that's going to go away. They need to lean into it. They need to start to deal with it. And they need to start to deal with it at the highest levels and work their way right down through the organization to be um, completely compliant. Um, I'm going to ping pong back and forth because I got several questions. Um, this one's for Ritesh. Uh, with regard to board and senior management, what's the best way to educate these types of folks in the organization? So the, the, the regulation itself has made it super easy because Article 20 talks about senior management accountability. So they are actually responsible, not only for signing off those risk management policies, but they are also responsible for overseeing the overall implementation. So they cannot, they cannot run away uh, from this. They absolutely have to go and be behind this uh, initiative. So that's one thing that makes it easier. Um, another thing that we have seen is um, uh, when we are trying to educate, it's very important to do that in a really practical way. So we do a lot of tabletop exercises where we can look into how uh, a threat actor may approach things like ransomware, how they are going to um, impact the organization, and how do you get prepared. So anything that is done on a more practical level gives the, the senior management the real visibility they need to be prepared. And on top of that, I think we in cybersecurity makes everything much more complex. So providing the metrics that is easy to understand and uh, the, the way we are approaching uh, to solve problems, if we can make this uh, in the way senior management can understand the business language makes things much easier as well. So there are a number of ways to do that and we are con uh, constantly advising the organization on how to, how to do that. Well, Marco, given uh, what Ritesh just said with regard to responsibility at the senior manager level, I think uh, if I were in senior management, I'd want to know um, how does Article 2, how does it define who qualifies as senior management? Well, it's not strictly defined uh, in the directive. So the directive mentions uh, management bodies. So they are the management bodies are responsible, they have the responsibilities. Um, so uh, under management bodies, for sure, we can assume that boards of directors will uh, absolutely qualify. Um, but also, if we look at C-levels like uh, CEOs and CISOs, uh, um, if a professional is uh, responsible for implementing uh, cybersecurity measures and or holds the budget for uh, implementing cybersecurity measures, in my opinion, will be considered as a, a management body and therefore could be held personally liable. Ritesh, with, uh, with organizations with limited resources, and, and again, this is something we see at Solutions Review all the time. You know, there, there are large companies that have lots of people that can 
uh, throw a team at compliance. Uh, but there are other organizations that are maybe a little uh, less uh, capable of being able to do that. Um, what would you provide for advice with regard for them to have the visibility to prepare themselves uh, for this sort of initiative? Yeah, Doug, what, what, I think one of the most challenging thing is how do you set your 24-7 uh, capabilities because you need a large team to do that and there are a number of organizations who provide that. So that's one thing that I would advise. The second thing which is quite uh, a big liability is the incident response. How do you notify 24 hours, 72 hours, uh, provide a final report? So working with an incident response partner who can help you with your practices and processes and create templates for you, again, helps quite a lot. So there are a number of organizations who can help support uh, companies with uh, who doesn't have a lot of resources who can do this would be a good starting point. And as you understand these regulations, as you understand these requirements more and more, uh, you can you can create efficient processes and you can minimize uh, what is required to get compliant. But one thing that is super important is get your uh, practices. So don't focus on compliance, focus on good cybersecurity uh, practices and compliance will automatically follow. Uh, that's how I've been advising people for 20 years and that's what I would say from this too. Things get complicated um, when you have affiliates in multiple EU countries. Uh, Marco, uh, is it necessary to communicate with uh, with all of the local authorities in each of the responsible countries? Yeah, good question. So uh, first of all, let's look at the jurisdiction. So the directive says that a company is subject to the jurisdiction of the authority in the country where the company is established. So if we follow that, if a company is established in multiple countries, it will be subject to the jurisdiction of the authorities in each country. Um, there are exceptions to this. So, for example, digital service uh, uh, providers, uh, uh, such as managed uh, service providers, managed security service providers, are subject to the jurisdiction of the authority where they have their main establishment. And we could discuss how to define main establishment. So, but this is uh, the jurisdiction. For what concerns instead the uh, um, the communication of uh, incidents with significant impact, uh, um, the NIST directive uh, basically mandates that the member state set up a single point of contact within the authority, and the single point of contact would be responsible for communicating with the covered entities, but also to communicate with other authorities. And also, the NIST directive uh, explicitly uh, mandate the member states simplify the reporting of incidents uh, through this single point of contact through their own authority. So we have to communicate with, so the single point of contact should uh, uh, operate as a liaison between authorities. Um, so this leads us to believe that the structure that ultimately will be put in place will be similar to what we have under GDPR with a lead authority taking the lead on communication of an incident and then liaising with the other authorities. Um, this is, let's say, the, the direction that the NIST directive gives to the member states. But of course, we have to wait uh, that member states uh, implement, uh, each member states implements the directive, set up the authorities, the single point of contact, and start identifying how they will liaise with each other. Uh, Marco, I just want to hang with you uh, because, um, because there is some nuance here um, with regard to essential entities and important entities. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what the key distinctions are between those two entities? Yeah, um, we discuss in which type of uh, sectors the essential important entities operate, but for what concerns the implementation of this directive, there are a few key distinctions, but the most important, in my opinion, is that uh, for what concerns uh, um, essential entities, there will be proactive supervision. And for what concerns important entities, there will be a reactive supervision. This means that essential entity will proactively be supervised, so there will be those checks and balances that we were discussing earlier, um, even if there is no incident. Uh, important entities instead will be investigated if they report an incident. But of course, this shouldn't be interpreted as uh, an incentive not to report anything, meaning I don't report anything, they will never look at me, because uh, it is reasonable to um, 
to foresee that uh, if there are several important entities that, uh, in an industry that uh, report incidents and one entity in the same industry doesn't, probably that will raise suspicions and could trigger an investigation. So that is, in my opinion, the main difference. Then, of course, there are some other differences. So the penalties will be stricter and, and action to take remedies will be stricter for essential entities. And also the penalties will be higher for essential entities. So we said that the cap for essential entities is uh, the greater of uh, 10 million euro and 2% of global turnover. And for important entities is 7 million euro, 1.4%. So those are the main differences, in my opinion. Uh, Marco, Ritesh, thanks very much for the time uh, and the great information. Uh, and best of luck with uh, all of your work over the next year. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate it. If your business would like to be featured in a future event, contact us today.